everyone to the Newburyport Literary Festival. My name is Jennifer Entwistle and I am the co-director of the festival. This is our 16th year. Um, the past two have been uh, through Zoom, but usually mm -hmm. we are in beautiful downtown Newburyport. So hopefully we'll be able to put on a live show for you next year and everybody will be able to come to town. This mm -hmm. is actually the final time slot for the festival. So this is our, our big finale. So thank mm -hmm. you for joining us. We are using Zoom webinar, which means that you'll be able to see and hear the panelists, but we won't be able to see or hear you. So we encourage you to use the chat window for discussion throughout the event. But if you have questions for the authors, please use the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your Zoom screen. That will queue up the questions so that we'll be able to take them uh, it, towards the end of this session. And I would just like to give a shout out to our partner booksellers, Jabberwocky Bookshop in Newburyport and the, book, mm -hmm. the Bookshop of Beverly Farms. I will put links to both of those bookstores in the chat window once we get started. Local independent bookstores need our support now more than ever. So I mm -hmm. just ask that, uh, you know, I encourage you to buy books, buy them local. If you have a favorite indie folk bookstore, then feel free to buy it there. But uh, let's support our indie booksellers and keep them going. Now I am going to turn this session over to Chris to take care of introductions. So Chris, take it away. All right, thank you very much. Um, and we are still waiting on uh, Deji, who hopefully will be logging in shortly. He, he might be having some technical difficulties, um, but welcome everyone. Uh, we're here to discuss uh, recent trends in science fiction and fantasy, and specifically the 2020 volume of the best American science fiction and fantasy, which was guest edited uh, in 2020 by Diana Gabaldon uh, under the series editorship of John Joseph Adams, who joins us today. Uh, my name is Chris Savasco. I'll be moderating today's panel, which features John, who I've already mentioned, as well as three, hopefully three hmm. other authors with uh, stories appearing in the 2020 volume. We have Charlie Jane Anders, Deji Bryce Olokoten, and Rebecca Roanhorse. And I'm really looking forward to our discussion. And I thought before we begin, I'd have um, each of us briefly introduce ourselves to those members of the audience not already familiar with, with your work. Um, so I'll start. And as I said, my name is Chris Sabasco. Uh, for the past few years, I've been working with John as the assistant series editor of the Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy Anthology. And I published Paradox, the magazine of historical and speculative fiction from 2003 to 2009. Um, I'm also a writer with stories in a, a couple of dozen magazines and anthologies. So why don't we start, uh, I guess, with John, and if, if everyone is seeing these in the same order that I'm hmm. seeing them on the screen, and then we'll go clockwise from John. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm John Joseph Adams. Uh, as Chris said, I'm the series editor of Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy. Um, and uh, I, I was the founding editor of it. I, I, I pitch, I'm the one that pitched it. I'm, not, I'm the reason it happened because I pushed to get it, make it happen. So that was pretty cool. Um, other than that, um, I've edited about 30 something anthologies. Um, I've been editing uh, Lightspeed Magazine since 2010. And I also um, am the publisher of uh, Nightmare Magazine and Fantasy Magazine um, and, and Lightspeed. Um, and uh, yeah, so I've just been around the end. I worked at the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction uh, originally. That was my first job in publishing. Uh, so I've been in the industry since like uh, 2001. Um, anyway, seen lots of trends over that time. And uh, Charlie Jane? Hi, I'm Charlie Jane Anders. Uh, my most recent book is Victories Greater Than Death. That's the cover behind me uh, with the awesome purple shiny hair. And I also uh, have a book coming out in August called Never Say You Can't Survive, which is a... Uh, it's a book about how to use creative writing to get through really hard and scary times, like political instability, but also mm -hmm. plagues, <laughs> you know, other problems. And, uh, you know, that's coming out in August. Uh, you can get Victories Greater Than Death from Jabberwocky Bookshop or the Bookshop of Beverly Farms. Please support indie bookstores. Thank you. <laughs> and Rebecca. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Roanhorse. Uh, I'm a New York Times bestseller and uh, Hugo uh, Nebula and Locus award-winning author. If you're not familiar with the Hugos and the Nebulas, those are sort of like the Nerd Academy Awards. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I always explain them to my relatives. Uh, and my latest novel is Black Sun, which I have on the shelf behind me, but maybe I'll put out later. Um, mm -hmm. And it is a big, sprawling, epic fantasy inspired by the indigenous cultures uh, of pre-Columbia Americas. 
and it is nominated this year for a Hugo and a Nebula Award as well. Excellent. Um, okay, so we're still waiting on Deji, but why don't we jump in? Um, I uh, wanted to start by talking about, so in her introduction to the 2020 volume, Diana Gabaldon writes about how one of the main themes that she saw when she was reading for this volume was stories of a, a doomed earth. And she notes, um, however, that whereas stories of this sort that were written, I guess, in the early to mid 20th century often tended to be about a doom that was arising from external forces like asteroids or aliens, those that are being written today seem almost exclusively to be about dooms for which humans are themselves responsible. And John, I know that you've also published more than one anthology of post-apocalyptic earth fiction. And uh, Deji has a story in this uh, um, anthology that is, uh, you know, sort of deals with an attempt to cope with a doomed earth. Although on its surface, it seems to be an externally caused doom. So that does buck the trend that Diana Gabaldon mentions. But I wonder if you and, and our other author panelists can speak a bit to this, both why you think this trend might be true and how you think the source of the doom impacts the writing or the tone of a doomed mm -hmm. earth story itself or anything yeah. else you want to say on the subject. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely have noticed the same thing. And uh, I think it, it's been going back at least as far back as, as 2001. I, I kind of trace it all the way back to 9-11 um, when suddenly the idea that we might destroy ourselves, uh, you know, renewed itself. You know, in, in the early days, you know, there was the Cold War and we thought we were going to destroy ourselves with nuclear weapons. But um, that sort of uh, fell fell uh, by the wayside in fiction uh, once the Cold War ended. And there was this like period of, of about a decade where nobody was really writing a lot of post-apocalyptic fiction, I think just because it seemed like, oh, well, we, we passed that uh, moment in our history. Um, and I think like, I feel like 9-11 kind of woke us up to the fact that, eh, no, we can actually still really destroy ourselves. Um, and then as things have progressed, you know, there's climate change that's uh, ravaging the earth and making it much more likely to, <laughs> that it seems like we're going to destroy ourselves potentially that way. Um, and um, I don't know, I think, um, so those trends have been going on for quite a bit. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that it makes it interesting from a narrative point of view is that um, when the when the when the cause of the strife is our own actions, it kind of feels more personal and uh, like important than it does when oh something's being done to us from external forces. Um, which you know I know it, not every story is as simplistic as that in terms of when there are external forces at play. But um, when the when the cause of the strife is just our own um, you know either uh, abuse of of resources and or our planet and or each other. Um, you know, that I feel like that kind of just makes for more interesting stories in general. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, obviously we're talking about a book of short stories that I guess came out in 2019, so before COVID. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there have been the signs of like apocalyptic, you know, stuff have been on the horizon for a while now. And, you know, I think climate change, we're all slowly waking up to the notion that climate change is not something that we're, is going to be dealt with in someone else's lifetime. It's going to be, we're going to be seeing the effects of climate change. We are seeing the effects of climate change in our lifetime, in the, you know, in the present and in the near future. And, you know, a lot of us who are, you know, who've been saying for years, oh, we're going to start seeing major disruptions from climate change. I think the last few years is when it really kind of jumped from like, we will start seeing them too. We are now seeing them. Like, you know, there's now forest fires everywhere. There's like more and more extreme weather events. It is it is really scary. And obviously in 2019, when all of these stories were written, we still had a government in the United States that basically was, you know, determined not to do anything about climate change. And that kind of didn't really believe in climate change as a matter of, you know, the government's opinion or whatever. And so I think that, um, you know, a lot of us are feeling like there is an urgency to just kind of taking people by the collar and shaking them and saying, you know, we're in real trouble here. And if we don't move fast, it'll be too late to do something about it, you know? So I think that is a part of it for sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, Rebecca, I think you're muted. Yes, I'm muted. there you are. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I think my view is just a, a little bit different. I think when I'm looking at uh, things, particularly like science fiction and fantasy, I'm looking at it 
uh, through a decolonial lens. So I'm wondering like what people used to be afraid of and what they're afraid of now and like mm -hmm. who's telling the stories. And so often I think this fear of the outside forces uh, is sort of part of the American uncanny. I think it's a fear of the other. I think it's a fear of immigration and, and brown people and, and all of that stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> that went along with colonizing space, you know, in this metaphor of colonization. Uh, and so I think who were who was telling the stories? Uh, mostly old white guys, to be quite frank. Uh, mm -hmm. And now you have a diversity of voices. Uh, you have people of color, BIPOC folks, you have uh, queer folks, disabled folks telling stories. And so what they fear is different. They don't fear the other the same way that, that uh, white writers uh, did back in the day. Uh, and they see um, the dangers around them, you know, the dangers that uh, we do to ourselves as human beings. And so those are the kinds of stories I think uh, that we are telling now. Uh, so yeah, that's sort of my take on it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, often I feel like these sorts of doomed earth stories, uh, particularly from the earlier 20th century, you, they, they've used the doom as a kind of an instigating factor that leads to a story that's actually about escaping from earth, while perhaps more recent stories seem more to me to be frequently tales of having to cope with or, you know, remaining on the doomed planet. Uh, of course, there's going to be, you know, exceptions to all these the, these generalizations. But again, you know, De Deji's story, um, unfortunately, he's, he's not with us, but, uh, you know, it does a bit of both. He has parallel stories in his tale with people staying on Earth coping, as well as those escaping. But what strikes me is that if the doomed Earth stories in the 2020 volume had, had been written a year earlier, as Charlie Jane was mentioning, we might see them as metaphors for living with coronavirus. But as these stories were all written pre-pandemic, there's something else going on here. And I wonder what, why do you think writers and maybe editors and readers are more drawn to stories nowadays about coping and surviving rather than stories of escape? Uh, well, I mean, I think uh, even without a pandemic, I mean, I think we were definitely forced to cope with a lot of stuff over the last several years uh, as, you know, um, all the political turmoil and everything that uh, Charlie Jane was referencing. It's like, I mean, uh, I mean, it was it was like a plague. <laughs> just it was like a social plague is is what it or and, and it felt like it was, it was like a daily barrage of of like um uh, just like psychic uh, torment, <laughs> and and it's like if I mean that's that's a that's a lot like that feels like a lot like a plague when you're suffering through it I think and so um, I I don't I don't think that it it doesn't seem that surprising to me that um, you know that stuff would have trended towards that kind of thing even ahead of the actual uh, like biological plague that we ended up suffering mm -hmm. um, so uh, so yeah I mean that's that's kind of what I um, think but. Um, I also think that just like these these kind of themes, like I, I while while there may have ended up uh, a lot, of, may, it may have been that a lot of ended up in this particular volume. I think like any given year, there actually are a lot of stories that are like written on these kinds of themes. Mm. Um, and if uh, it, this might say mo a little bit more about like Diana's uh, per uh, particular uh, focus or taste or preference uh, than an overall um, like sort of increase in this kind of thing. Um, so, so I mean, that's something to keep in mind as sure. well when you're evaluating these things. Yeah, um, I, no, okay, go okay. ahead. I was just gonna say, I'm gonna be a broken record. <laughs> and say, you know, a lot of that escapism is, you know, this whole concept of white flight, you mm -hmm. know, and that there was still somewhere you could run, you could run to the suburbs, you could try to get away. Mm -hmm. uh, even this idea of colonizing space as the final frontier. Uh, there were still places, you know, in the imagination that you could go. Uh, and maintain sort of your status quo way of life. Uh, and I think that that is changing. Uh, well, you know, to a certain degree, perhaps it's whose story, who's telling the stories, I guess, that's changing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's why the concerns, you know, are different because um, you can't run away from who you are. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think when uh, BIPOC folks and other people are telling their stories, there's an acknowledgement of that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I just want to jump in and, you know, kind of second everything Rebecca just said, but also I think, I mean, this idea of like, oh, we're just going to leave Earth and go colonize some other planet and it's going to be hunky dory and like, oh, yeah, we have a disposable planet, you know, we'll just like, we'll, we'll just, we will just go through like planets, we'll just chew through planets and like when we use one up, we'll go to the next one. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that 
that that was always a fantasy. It was always a fantasy for a bunch of reasons. And I think that we've gotten, I don't know if it's just that the science has gotten, we've learned more about like the date, the, the difficulties and dangers of like trying to colonize another planet, even in our solar system. Um, or if it's that, uh, you know, we, we always kind of knew that it was really unlikely that we'd be able to like actually create an independent settlement on Mars or any other planet, you know, in the next, you know, I don't know, hundreds of years. Uh, but it feels like this is this kind of like per, uh, persistent fantasy that that was really never realistic. And I, I, a couple of years ago, I was interviewing an, a, a, an exoplanet expert for a piece I was writing. And she, I didn't get to use this in the article, but she was basically like, look, none of the other planets in our solar system are habitable by humans. They're not gonna be. Like there's not, we don't have the capability to make them independently habitable. Any mm. colony that we establish on any other planet is going to require constant re, uh, you know, re resupply and re kind of freshment from Earth. And, you know, even outside our solar system, getting getting to another planet outside our solar, solar system is a whole other thing. And those planets are going to have their own challenges. They might just not be habitable for a bunch of reasons involving like the types of cosmic radiation. I'm, I'm totally borking what she told me. I'd have to go back and look at my notes. Mm -hmm. But there are real real scientific reasons why this fantasy that like people like Elon Musk are always trying to push, I think, that like, oh, we'll just get another planet, you know? Mm -hmm. And it does kind of come back to this logging for like what Rebecca was talking about, this logging for like, we're just going to keep pushing forward. We can just like trash this place mm -hmm. and then go find another place. And like, you know, nope, we ran out of places to trash. And mm -hmm. it's we're not just going to be able to keep moving forward like a shark to escape the destruction we've caused. You know, mm -hmm. we're going to have to actually stop and fix some stuff. Like it's like Kim Stanley. Rob sorry, I'm going to stop. But it's like Kim Stanley Robinson says, there is no planet B. Mm -hmm. This is it. We got one planet, and we're we're messing it up. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I I I would agree. Uh, <laughs> we, we are. Um. So, so uh, hopefully we'll stop messing it up. Um. You know, another question I wanted to touch on is, so for better or for worse, uh, you know, the 1930s and the 1940s are often referred to as the golden age of science fiction. And so we've now had about 100 years or so of stories. Um, and something that has, I think, now long been a popular trend is taking the sort of science fiction and fantasy tropes that have developed over this century and kind of turning them on their heads in some way. So we get stories like Victor Laval's Up From Slavery, which is in this volume, and reinvents certain sort of Lovecraftian tropes in a powerful and clever way, um, much as he does in his novel, Ballad of Black Tom. Or Tobias Buckel's story, which takes on sort of the aliens visiting Earth trope and plays it for humor. Um, what do any of you think it takes to use a recognized trope and turn it on its head, but not merely just to kind of change up to down or switch A to Z, but to really do it successfully and provocatively so that we end up with something very you know unique that lets us see the underlying trope in a whole new way uh i'll, I'll jump on that first because this <laughs> is something that i obsess about all the time and like you know if you look at my work i'm always kind of trying to take tropes and turn them mm -hmm. you know sideways or, or mess with them i think that you know the the thing that happens when you take an existing trope and you're just like i'm gonna subvert it or i'm gonna like you know the danger is that you're just going to reproduce it, but you're going to like just switch it around or, or tweak mm -hmm. it. And it's still going to be the same harmful trope. You're just going to like either change who's being harmed or kind of just like not interrogate the underlying assumptions of the trope. And you're just going to, it's going to be like, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not going to actually do anything to kind of like remedy the, like the, the harm that that trope causes. And I think that you have a responsibility when you use any trope, even if you're doing it, playing it, playing it kind of straightforward, or if you're kind of like subverting it, you have a responsibility to really kind of interrogate the trope and think about like, why do we have this trope? What does it actually mean? What's it about? Why do we keep coming back to this notion? And often you find assumptions buried in the trope that are, you know, colonialist, imperialist, white supremacist, you know, assumptions and, or, or you know, misogynistic in, in many cases, assumptions or, you know, or anti-queer. Uh, or ableist, sorry, we just stopped listing ists, but you find these assumptions breeding these tropes and it's your responsibility not just to be like, well, I'll just turn it sideways, but to actually kind of interrogate them and kind of like confront them head on mm -hmm. and to kind of 
put them together in a new way if you're and and address it i think and that's what when you see people doing like smart takes on lovecraft that's what you're seeing mm -hmm. anyone else on that or will mm, i think i, don't know I think that I have, you know a lot of the tropes i think charlie jane's talking about like harmful tropes there are some tropes that are not sure. necessarily harmful i mean uh, a trope is just sort of like uh, you know, a, a narrative setup that we're all familiar with, uh, like the chosen one or the love triangle. You can mm. have things like that that are a little uh, uh, less weighty, although I would say the chosen one perhaps is more weighty than uh, we like to think about. Mm. Uh, and, you know, um, engage in those. Like, I like a lot of tropes and, and tropes can serve you as a writer. But I think Charlie Jane is right that you need to understand sort of what's at the foundation of that trope and how it came about and and why we like it. Uh, so you can't just uh, sort of be like, oh, I'm going to flip it. You know, that's you got to really engage it and you can have a conversation with it uh, and you can sort of show all sides of it. Uh, and you can sort of play with the idea uh, in a in a fun way. Um, but uh, you you it's sort of like you have to know the rules to break them. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a very similar uh, sort of engagement. Yeah, I mean, it's, so speaking of benign tropes, I, to some extent, actually, I, and it, I guess it doesn't surprise me to hear Charlie Jane that you like to play with tropes. Um, your story in this volume, it, in my view, kind of does a bit of that subversion of tropes um, by doing something interesting with with what might be called the sort of magic bookshop trope. Um, because, in, you know, what I found interesting was that in most stories of this sort, the bookshop is the conduit into another reality. But in your story, it seemed almost as if the bookstore is the last holdout of our own reality in which we try to balance these increasingly polarized elements of society. And it's the rest of the world in your setting outside the bookshop that is the the science fictional departure into kind of a near future dystopia where uh, you know American society has fully fractured. So you know the bookshop is kind of like the last remaining bridge between the two poles. And I'm wondering when you set out to write this story in particular, what what do you think made you choose a bookshop as the lens through which you wanted to examine the current social and political divide? I mean, I love bookshops. I think that you know, um, yeah. I mean, I'm. I'm wearing a hoodie that says shop local bookstores. Mm -hmm. I am a big fan of independent bookshops. I think bookshops are, you know, the lifeblood of our communities and they are, you know, they're a vital irreplaceable part of like our book ecosystem and they're just magical places. I love bookstores. And I think that, you know, part of what I was thinking about when I kind of came up with that idea for that story was this thing where, you know, part of our, as you put it, increasing polarization is that we can't agree on stories and that we have like vastly different stories. And, you know, we're now at the point, it's sort of like that, you know, there was that dress on the end that everybody freaked out about like five or six years ago, where it was like either blue and black or white yeah. and gold or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we're now at a point where people can watch the same video of the same incident and, but they've seen a completely different video depending on their ideological lens. And, you know, in general, again, you know, I wrote this, we wrote these stories before 2020, but, you know, the fact that like the 2020 election was one thing or a completely different thing, depending on who you ask, like either it was like a, a fair election or it was this weird, you know, there was, I don't know, it's people, people increasingly cannot agree on like a shared reality or a shared and it all comes down to storytelling. It all comes down to what stories do we tell? What stories do we accept as legitimate? And who's who's allowed to tell the stories? But also just like, what, you know, how do we, what are the, what lens do we view reality through? And I think that storytelling is the kind of battlefield and it's the, uh, it's also the solution. Like if we can find ways to kind of write, make stories that, that break through, that hopefully make people who are kind of out of touch with reality get more in touch with reality, at least, you know, I think that that's the one hope we have at this point before we actually arrive at the scenario in my story where basically the United States is fractured in half and, you know, which I think is probably what's going to happen. Like, I'm just going to, I think that, mm -hmm. you know, that book that my story comes from, John and John Joseph Adams and Victor Laval edited this anthology called The People's Future of the United States. Mm -hmm. And I did an event with one of the other authors of the book. And someone asked, like, we both had stories in which the United States is fractured and broken in 
to different like no longer a unified country and did we think that was like really going to happen we both were like yeah of course it's definitely going to happen mm -hmm. but anyway sorry so I, I think that storytelling is like the the last kind of it's the battlefield and it's also the last hope kind of interesting yeah um i i just want to say real quick like how incisive that question was chris like props for that like i i, I really i really enjoyed that um okay. especially given that I, I i edited the anthology that first appeared in and then also like i thought it was one of the best and so it's in it's in, in best american but uh so good job on that question all right uh, all right well we're not here to talk about me today we're here to talk <laughs> um but actually i'm going to turn to rebecca now with this next question because i want i want to turn to um this idea of retold or reinterpreted myths and folk tales which have long been a mainstay of science fiction and fantasy and they continue to be reflected in the you know the stories in the 2020 volume um we've got stories like sp somtow's another avatar and rebecca's a brief lesson in native american astronomy and part of, I guess, what defines a myth is, in some sense, the timelessness of its message. And um, so, Rebecca, in your story, you took a Tewa myth that traditionally is given an historical setting, and you gave it a near future sort of cyberpunk setting that allowed you to extrapolate the sort of the myth's themes of obsessive love and holding on to memories of the departed into such sort of science fictional concepts as biological memory or digital reincarnation. And is there a reason, do you think, that you chose a futuristic milieu for your retelling rather than a present day setting or even a fantasy world setting? I mean, did that choice change, do you think, in some ways, the archetypes of Deer Hunter or White Corn Maiden, or, or perhaps did it reinforce what they represent? I mean, essentially, how do you think that the science fictional setting impacts the reader's relationship to the underlying myth? Right. Well, it is my my personal goal to constantly put Native Americans in the future, uh -huh. All right. <laughs> because uh, we are so often stuck in the past. Uh, and you know, there there have been like uh, polls that said you know something like forty eight percent of the population uh, don't even know that natives still exist. Mm. Uh, so you know that's a bummer. <laughs> yeah. So so I'm always trying to put folks in the future. Uh, but I think you know you hit on something when you talk about the timelessness of the story. Uh, you know, I think we we tend to think that our ancestors uh, were somehow primitive uh, in their thinking or are stuck uh, somehow lesser than us intellectually because uh, they didn't have uh, what we would formally call science. Uh, but of course, that's silly. Uh, humans have the same sort of basic needs and desires and uh, social structures that they've always had. Uh, and so these these stories, these timeless myths are there for a reason. Uh, they, they speak to something uh, inherent in us as in our human experiences. And so that's uh, really why I picked that one. It's a lesser known story, obviously, uh, but certainly it resonates. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's near future and it's nearer to the present than I even knew when I mm -hmm. when I started to construct that story. A lot of the ideas uh, in the story are actually happening now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the idea that you can, um, you know, sort of recreate uh, uh, a clone or um, a simulation rather that you can interact with from uh, your deceased loved ones. Like that's something that's starting to happen, you know, and they have like uh, celebrities in the story. The two main characters are actors. They're like celebrities. Mm -hmm. and so they're obsessed with image and beauty and things like that as well. Uh, and I'm seeing more and more that you're able to create like artificial celebrities, like online, like these, these celebrities don't even exist, mm -hmm. but people interact with them and, you know, they fan them and, you know, they are stand them, I guess, I guess you have to have the verb of that. Uh, and, you know, you, and, uh, are obsessed with them and all of these sorts of things. And they're just simulations. They're not, they're not people. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it's a little future, but it's a little here and now as well. Hmm. Anyone else want to talk about uh, retold myths or? How no one else retold a myth. <laughs> no, no, but you know, <laughs> might have an opinion. They're like, whatever, whatever, yeah. road horse. <laughs> um, well, no, no. I mean, it's. I, I will say also that after reading your story, it did encourage me to go track down the underlying mm -hmm. myth that you based it on, and 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 it. Uh, you know, I enjoyed your story a ton when I read it the first time, and I enjoyed it even more on a whole other level once I read those mm -hmm. myths and saw the things that you were playing with. Mm -hmm. So kudos, that was really well done, actually. Um, we So we've 
you know, we've spoken a lot about the trends that Diana Gabaldon saw in these stories. And I'm wondering what sorts of trends are you all seeing? Uh, John, either in the slush piles for your various mm -hmm. editorial duties or when you're reading for Best American Science Fiction mm -hmm. Fantasy. And for the authors, I mean, do you notice any new or emerging trends either in what you've been reading or in your own writing, like tropes or subjects or themes that you find yourself returning to recently? John, I mean, wanna, or whoever. Yeah, yeah John, yeah. John, go first. John, okay. John sees uh, everything. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, the 2020 stories. Uh, obviously, we saw a lot of people reacting to COVID, and uh, but and also still um, the political uh, political reactions and everything to all the turmoil going on there. Um, but then also just over the uh, this isn't new to like this year, but um, just like in in recent years, um, there's been. Um, you know, uh, I don't like to call it a trend just because it feels like just a thing that should be, but, you know, people are feeling more welcome in the, in in this space of, of science fiction and fantasy, and so they're putting themselves in stories, and uh, so, you know, and, and, you know, you're getting more representation mm. on the author side as well, and so that's by far been, I think, like the biggest trend, if you want to call it that, but um, in terms of just, if you're talking about like changes from years past, um, and uh, and that's been, and I think that's made um, uh, the sort of slush and or just like the published, you know, if you call best American reading slush, whatever, you know, the, hmm. the, 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 the breadth of material, it just makes it really more uh, vibrant and interesting because it's like, it's coming from these different perspectives that uh, maybe I'm not as familiar with. And it's like, I feel like, that's like inherently what science fiction and fantasy is all about. And so like anybody who like rebels against that seems like, it seems really strange to me. It's like, so, I mean, you want to read stories about like aliens and stuff, but like, you don't want to read stories from like a point of view of people on this planet that, that mm -hmm. is just different than yours. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's by far like the biggest uh, sort of trend of things that I see, but then, and then otherwise just sort of people reacting to, to current events and all that kind of thing. Sure. Um, Uh, I, were you going to say something earlier, Charlie, Jane? Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things that I'm really excited to see in, in speculative fiction right now is sort of queer versions of like kind of horror and fantasy and even science fiction tropes that all are kind of like about different ways of embodiment and different ways of like, you know, different relationships to, you know, the world. And like, you know, I've seen a lot of like, science fiction and fantasy recently by queer and trans authors where it feels like, you know, there's like one person who can be in multiple bodies or there's people whose identities are kind of fluid in some way or people who are, you know, there's like a lot of stories that are kind of thinking about the question of like how we relate to our bodies and how our physical presence interacts with the world in ways that are clearly shaped by the experience of being trans or non-binary or just queer in general. And, you know, I just read, I've just been reading Unity by Ellie Bangs, but also some of Vito Sipri's short stories, some of Isabel Yap's short stories that I've read recently. I feel like there's just some really interesting, like queer takes on, you know, personhood and embodiment mm -hmm. and being in the world, mm -hmm. which I'm just like super excited to see all that, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that's really fun. Mm -hmm. I noticed, um, I was looking through uh, NetGalley yesterday for something good to read, and NetGalley is like um, uh, a publishing website that lets you read books before they're, they come out. It's, it's for reviewers mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. And one of the, the best perk of being a published author is that you often get to read books, uh, you know, a year in advance mm -hmm. of when they come out. Uh, so, and I noticed a trend on there in science fiction and fantasy was there are a lot of books written from the villain's perspective, oh. written oh. by women. Hmm. Uh, oh. And I, I was like, well, what's up with that? You know, and I didn't know if that was sort of like a, a reclaiming of, hmm. you know, the female villain uh, and, and, you know, in a more sort of sympathetic light, sort of what had been going on with the idea of, um, uh, what is the, the Angelina Jolie Disney movie? Maleficent, they, yeah. Maleficent. Yeah, yeah Maleficent. Right, right. Yeah, Maleficent yeah, you know, and now like Cruella. Yes. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. There's a Corella coming out. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, things like that. So that seems to be uh, the, a trend over the next year, uh, which I thought was sort of interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'll see where that goes and how that plays out. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, you know, another thing is, so we're talking about, you know, this anthology that collects science fiction, 
and fantasy. And I know that John tries to achieve something of a balance mm -hmm. between the number of stories that fall into one genre or the other. But, you know, as we've gone through the stories, at least for the past few years since I've been working with you, John, and I'm sure before that, there are mm -hmm. an awful lot of stories that blur that line mm -hmm. where, yeah. where it's, you know, it's hard to say, is it science mm -hmm. fiction? Is it fantasy? Right. Is it both? Is it neither in some cases, <laughs> yeah. but it still somehow feels like it, it's right. trying to be. So, you know, putting aside that genre labels like this are largely just marketing tools mm -hmm. anyway that mm -hmm. are slapped on after the fact. I, I, I do think, though, that there, at least in, from my perspective, there seems to be less of a distinction between mm -hmm. science fiction and fantasy than there used to be. Yeah. Uh, why, why do you think that might be? And, and as writers, I'm curious, mm -hmm. how much do you ever even think about that when you're writing your stories? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know why it is uh, the the case, but I mean, like that definitely has been the trend over the last, uh, you know, all the time that I've been in publishing, where uh, these distinctions are seem to be falling by the wayside. But it's it's kind of harder to tell: is it a thing that actually I'm observing happening in real time, or is it just that I'm growing as a reader and my perceptions of what is what is changing with my you know growth as a reader. Um, and uh, because I mean, certainly when when I first came into the industry, it's like I had a very uh, strict understanding of like what science fiction is versus what fantasy is, and uh, like and and actually got blown up really quick, you know. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, I think uh, one of the one of the things that I find most frustrating, uh, both in Lightspeed and in Best American, and it's extra frustrating because I did it to myself, but I, I decided that there would be uh, this equal representation of science fiction and fantasy in both Lightspeed and in Best American. And so it's like, uh, now I got to put everything into boxes. <laughs> it's like, I got to decide, is this science fiction or is it fantasy? And you know, a lot of times, like, I mean, actually, if you look at the Amazon reviews for any Best American volume, uh, like, there's a bunch of people who give it, like, one or two stars and be like, oh, it's all fantasy. It's all fantasy. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, uh, you know, and, and it's just, like, it's just really hilarious to me because it's, like, when, when I go through all this effort to, like, specifically make sure that there's at least half science fiction and half fantasy and then people are still complaining it's all fantasy. But it, I think it comes back to that idea that, you know, there's people have one idea, like, maybe they have this, like, John W. Campbell idea of what science fiction is or whatever, like stuck in the, you know, 40s or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I don't know, uh, but uh, it, it is interesting. Um, and it, it is very frustrating as an editor when you, when you have to put things in boxes and it's hard to tell which box do they go in. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I'm going to blame Star Wars. No, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm allowed to say that. I wrote a Star right. Wars book once upon a time. Right. Uh, but um, I mean, Star Wars is probably our most beloved science mm -hmm. fantasy uh, sort of um, franchise, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's science fiction, it's space opera, but you know, we have space wizards because mm -hmm. what are the Jedi, but really magical wizards. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think the genres like that have always blended or have at least blended since the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, and we just haven't really acknowledged it. Like mm -hmm. there's a lot of science fantasy out there. I know mm -hmm. that my uh, works, like my uh, Six World series, uh, has been accused of being a science <laughs> fantasy because it's a post-apocalyptic setting. Uh, it's, you know, post-climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, you know, it's also about myth and magic and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and I think some of the best books, it's a really a shame. I saw some the chat go by real quick that someone said that Barnes & Noble had now split up their mm -hmm. science fiction and their fantasy into different shelves. And I'm like, well, who gets to decide? Oh, that sounds terrible to me. Uh, because some of the best work is this, is when when authors set those boxes aside, as John said, and just write the story they want to write. Uh, and often that blends because our world is blended. Our thoughts are blended. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't say, well, now I'm going to think about science. And then now we're here, I'm going to think about fantasy. Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly those two things even in our daily lives uh, mix together. Uh, so it would make sense that it would mix together in our writing as well. Daisy, oh my God, you made it, you made it. Oh my God, you're here. Hi, hey. yeah, just caught the tail end. So I'll summarize everything that came before. My apologies for <laughs> being late. Yay. Oh, welcome, we're glad you're here. We were just your opening act. Yes. <laughs> we're just warming it up for you. So Charles Jane, did you want to talk any about that science fiction fantasy divide or you? Know, you I'll just say very quickly, you know, Star Wars, every superhero universe, mm -hmm. there you go. Yeah. Adventure Time, 
Shira, I don't think there's a popular franchise or popular media thing of the last 10 years that doesn't make science fiction and fantasy. It's just normal now. Mm-hmm. I think that it's almost inescapable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, so the next thing I was thinking about with regard to this anthology in particular, and may, you know, may, this may be a very easy yes or no answer, but um, you know, it is limited by mm-hmm. definition to stories by North American based writers published in North American venues. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know, John, do you have any sense how a collection like this might differ or be similar to ones collecting Mm -hmm. fiction either from across the globe or limited Mm -hmm. to a different geographic region? Are there trends that you're seeing Mm -hmm. elsewhere that you haven't been seeing here or vice Mm -hmm. versa? Uh, You know, perhaps not, but. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's it's harder to say just because I do focus most of my reading on the stuff that is eligible for Best American. But, um, you know, in terms of like the stories that I'm publishing in the magazines and stuff, I definitely see, you know, uh, different things being written from people who are outside of North America. And and honestly, I mean, if I if I had say over what was eligible for this 100 percent, I'd say, like, just forget about this stupid geographical restriction. Like, let's just, you know, but it's called Best American. So what are you going to do? I did I did like sort of push the boundary a little bit further to be like, uh, because at first it was like America and Canada. I'm like, well, why is Canada get brought in here? If it's like, if we're going to put if we're going to put restrictions on it, what Canada is not America. Uh, and so it's like, okay, well, if we're, if it's North America, then Mexico is included. And then, oh, also Caribbean is included. That's part of North America. Uh, and so, uh, so yeah, I, I sort of have pushed the boundaries as far as, uh, mm-hmm. as it can go there and still be legitimately called like American mm-hmm. <laughs> and shrug. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess we're, we're closing in on the time that we, we might want to start taking some Q&A from the audience. Um, I, I just want to touch on, so we did mention a little bit earlier about, you know, how we're probably seeing or starting to see or will start to see some sort of trends that arise out of coronavirus and, and you know, that th- this whole pandemic uh, that we're going through. And uh, I'm wondering, though, what kinds of stories and trends, other than the obvious, you know, dealing with a pandemic, uh, you know, what kind of trends do you think might grow out of this movement, or for that matter, out of any of the other, you know, seemingly half dozen major watershed moments that we seem to be living through simultaneously? What what trends do you think we might be looking at on the horizon, arising out of current events? Uh, whoever would like to jump in. Yeah. <laughs> Deji hasn't got to say anything yet. Have any thoughts? Oh well, that's my own doing. Thank yeah. you for <laughs> giving me the. Thanks for giving the mic. What I spend a lot of time in terms of what I spend a lot of time thinking about right now is uh, inequality, mm-hmm. um, and unfortunately, that plays into, um, you know, dystopian narratives, which I know people are a lot of people are jaded and tired of of hearing about those. But uh, I think the figure I saw. And maybe misquote, maybe off by a trillion or so, was that um, you know the, the extremely wealthy uh, people made eight trillion dollars during trillion mm. during uh, the pandemic, mm-hmm. um, and that divide is deeply, deeply troubling. Um, you know, good on you if 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 you made that, um, but I think I hope it's not a moment when inequality got accelerated, uh, but it feels like documenting this moment is so important for those kinds of, for stories, including science fiction, because, you know, when I, when I meet people who are libertarian, and you know, that anyone can have that viewpoint, um, I say, well, yeah, have you been to Nigeria? You know, that's kind of a libertarian model, and that's where a lot of my fiction is based. If, if the going is good in Nigeria, you can live a really tremendous li- lifestyle. You have all the first class stuff that anyone in any developed country has. All the, you have servants, you have super fast internet, which people may not realize. You might, you'll have the latest technology, you'll have it all, but you'll also be surrounded by a tall fence. Uh, you'll have bodyguards. You have to travel in an entourage and you're gonna have ongoing concerns for the physical safety of, of the people you love. Um, that's the libertarian, you know, and you, you move out of your little enclave and there's, you know, people begging on the streets in poverty. I don't wanna to paint too, you know, it's a complicated place. There's a lot happening. It's a big country, a lot of diversity, but for me, just the thing that I just can't 
stop thinking about today is um, there'd be a lot of, there's been a lot of heroic behavior by a lot of people and we, you know, we got to celebrate that. But in terms of the story, it could be a watershed moment where if we don't start caring, at least in, in the American context, caring about our neighbors and stuff like this could be the moment where the dystopian became more, more real than ever. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's kind of troubling in terms of actual science fiction. It's so hard to write, um, as, as I'm sure your, your panelists have, have, have mentioned, uh, when you're going, living through it, um, because the truth seems to always be stranger than fiction. And, mm. but, but that notion of inequality, it's something that people have been talking about for a while. It's just right now, just the f it would be one thing if, if, if uh, you know, the, the wealthiest amongst us stayed steady, but the fact that they got richer during this moment, you know, like that is the part that is really troubling. People are really suffering, people are dying. And so for me, it's, it, it relates back to the dystopian narrative. Yeah, I just want to chime in really quickly and say that absolutely everything Deji just said is 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 absolutely spot on. I think that you know part of the the horror of the pandemic is that it really affected. It really was unevenly distributed, like in terms of the harm and the the suffering, and like you have essential workers and like you know frontline workers and just like people working in restaurants and shops and stuff who were really horribly hard hit and then there were those of us like me who you know just was like oh well i'm just gonna stay home for a while i guess i like mm -hmm. you know it's just those of us who have jobs where we can work from home because we're you know moving ideas around mm -hmm. uh in our on a computer or whatever it's just and i think that it's hard to escape from that reality of like it just really highlights the stuff that was already baked into our society the inequalities that were already baked in and I hope that we're going to see thoughtful stories about that, not even necessarily pandemic stories, but stories that deal with that divide, mm -hmm. because it's such a huge big deal. Mm -hmm. And I think this is Rebecca. I'm in a writer's room, so I'm used to going, this is Rebecca. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, and I think uh, um, we'll also see stories about isolation, like the other thing that uh, Charlie mm -hmm. Jane just touched on, uh, and people dealing with sort of... Um, uh, the collapse of family uh, and uh, the inaccessibility of, um, uh, I guess, uh, human touch, you know, and, and things like that. I think particularly of like elderly people who, who were really super isolated. Uh, so at some of the hardest, you know, times of this pandemic uh, and just, you know, people in general, you're in a city, but you're locked in your tiny apartment and you can't interact you know, uh, physically with people and, and what that looks like and, and what sort of the psychological impacts of that are. Mm. All right. Um, I do want to leave a little time here, I guess, for some Q&A from the audience. We do have some questions that have been popping up. Um, <clears throat> this one is interesting. So th this uh, audience member asks, so the panelists have spoken about traditions like post-apocalyptic and dystopian. How do the panelists respond to the notion of fiction that proposes solutions, alternative worlds, and challenges through depictions of utopia? And that's a question by E.R. Hoffer. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that, anyone? Utopias. Well, I mean, I think uh, it's it's an interesting. Uh, it, it sounds like an interesting idea when you think about it in the in the respect of like how. Uh, you know, fiction often challenges us to think about uh, social issues in a different way and, and in a way that just like reciting facts at you is not going to because there's that like human element of the characters dealing with the issue. But when you, um, the challenge of utopian stories is that it's harder to, uh, to, to sort of have a utopia and then have a sufficient conflict in the story to, to really make it all work. But I mean, if you're talking about building toward a utopia, I think that could be really interesting. And I mean, any utopia isn't going to really be a utopia anyway. I mean, because like not not with people living in it, it's like <laughs> there's going to, you know, it's just impossible, like because somebody's going to not, it's not going to be a utopia to somebody. Uh, and that's the whole thing with them, with, with utopias is that, you know, sure, some for some people it's utopia, for some people it's not. Um, and that's, it, it just seems unavoidable. Um, and 
I mean, I think it could be interesting. It, it'd be an interesting challenge to writers to see if people could actually come up with things that were like, you know, even if it's just a fantasy of, uh, you know, like not actually possible at all to to come up with a utopia that 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 just is somehow good for everybody. But uh, it's hard to imagine it working as a story. Uh, so I don't know. I think that's maybe that's why we don't see it as much. But hmm. Yeah, I think it's really important to peel apart those two notions, the notion of like hope and working towards a better, you know, and finding solutions to climate change and inequality and all the other structural problems we're facing versus like utopia. I think that hope and solutions and like trying to like grapple with our huge problems is incredibly important and vital work that we need to be doing. I think utopias are nonsense and garbage and we should stop talking about them. I think we should just banish the word utopia from our from our vocabulary altogether <laughs> because it's it's just it it doesn't lead anywhere helpful it's it's just it's it's a it's a dead end mm -hmm. yeah, and I, I think um so i i'm uh, have been fortunate to be very involved with the uh, arizona state center for science and imagination and they do these um regularly regular exercises um which some people call speculative futures um <laughs> and uh the past I guess last January was actually the last trip I took before the pandemic started. Um, we had a group of folks at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, some scientists from ASU, an artist, a visual artist, uh, different writers. Um, and uh, we talked about what would energy futures look like. And so it was a collaborative uh, writing process. Each of the scholars and scientists wrote an essay about whatever their focus was. Um, and then we, uh, I wrote a fiction piece and a few other authors, Paolo Bajikalupi, I think I, mm -hmm. yeah, Bajikalupi wrote a story. There were a couple of great authors who wrote stories, but it was a fun fiction exercise because uh, basically I, we, we wrote the story together and I just was the one who put it, put it down on words. Mm. And that, that anthology just came out. Um, I would say, I think there, there's a ton of value in that exercise. The fiction that tends to come out of those exercises, I could get in trouble for saying this, tends not to be as strong uh, on its own in terms of fiction, like a pure, like purely great science fiction story. And I think that's partly because of the constraints of the process. Um, and they're often very time constrained too. So you have to write it quickly and your deadlines are fast. I mean, that happens to a lot of science fiction authors, but um, it is a great thing that um, people are replicating all over the world in different contexts. I wouldn't say it's a utopia or a dystopian exercise, but it is um, what Charlie mentioned, you know, searching for hope and providing hope in a very structured way. I'm involved right now with one at the UN Refugee Agency and we're doing a similar exercise. Um, and that's a, that's a global group of folks from Brazil and all over the world uh, who are working on that. And it's got its own challenges. Each one is different, um, but um, I think there's plenty of space for if you actually wanna apply it to policy solutions there, the idea is you're, we're, we're trying to imagine what migration might look like 20 years from now. And, you know, and there's lots of interesting things about that for, you know, if we have better internet, it may mean you don't have to migrate to a new country. You can work from where you are, um, or some other. You know, there's all kinds of factors: climate, um, refugees, things like that. Um, so it's a really long-winded answer, but I think there are actually people who try to like apply this stuff to policy solutions, and it, it it can work. It can also be pretty dry. It can be great. Sometimes there's a spark. Sometimes there isn't. Hmm. Um, there's a question here from an audience member who mentions that they teach science fiction at a girls' school, an all-girls' school, and, mm -hmm. and this, they mentioned that this is particularly a question for Rebecca. Uh, they want to know, what do you think is distinctly different? Um, I guess maybe they mean, what are, what are some of the special challenges about writing science fiction and fantasy featuring women? Mm. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I write human beings in my stories. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I don't believe in a gender binary, so I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I think character is character. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and uh, I think what you do is you write 
uh, great characters uh, and you give them purpose and and meaning and uh and goals and failures and you know complications and all of that stuff uh i've never had um trouble writing women into my fantasy or science fiction um because that's where they belong i'm not i'm not mm -hmm. sure how to answer that okay fair enough yeah. yeah well as the other woman on the panel and i i actually <laughs> don't fully understand why that was a question just for rebecca Mm -hmm. uh because <laughs> hello mm -hmm. women here um that, that kind of bewilders me i mean i want to second what rebecca said i think that you know uh it's really a i think we you know what i i want to refer back to what i said before about tropes a lot of the tropes that we end up kind of reproducing in in sci-fi and fantasy are very gendered tropes and mm -hmm. they often contain these little nuggets of misogyny inside them that people sometimes unthinkingly reproduce and when I write female characters, like, for example, sometimes I've had times in the past where I'm like, well, this person could have a near miss with sexual assault, or this person could experience a sexual assault, and that would, you know, spur them to do something. And then I have to kind of stop myself and think, you know what, using sexual assault to motivate a female character or any character is, is a trope that has to be used with extreme care, if, if at all. I think that, you know, you just really need to be careful about how you approach something like that because it's it's a cheap way to generate character development for usually for female identified characters and so things like that i think you have to be mindful about the tropes that are kind of gendered and that are that contain these misogynistic assumptions in them and i will add one thing just a small thing uh, and i actually stole this from max gladstone who is a, a great uh, uh speculative fiction writer uh from the boston area uh, and, you know, some of your, I think we tend to fall into uh, sort of um, uh, patterns of creating characters, like if we're going to create a security guard, it's going to be uh, a male, you know, or if we're going to mm. create a secretary, it's going to be a female. Uh, so little things. Uh, mm. So what Max does in his books constantly, and I would find myself going, oh, well, of course mm. that can be a woman, or of course mm. that can be, you know, a uh, non-binary non -binary person. Uh, is to challenge those like as a writer you need to challenge your own assumptions you have to constantly be mm -hmm. questioning yourself sort of like charlie jade said there's little nuggets of our own sort of limitations and the things that we've been taught uh sort of planted in our brains uh mm -hmm. and when you get them down on paper it can be really problematic mm -hmm. so you really have to sort of always uh be challenging yourself always questioning yourself uh and that's honestly one of the joys of being a writer is mm -hmm. that you really get to push your own growth Mm -hmm. And I just do want to follow up. I think the, the, the audience member mentioned that they only directed that to Rebecca because they actually have taught Rebecca's books in their class. And so they were trying to follow up on that. So yeah, that, that was confusing. I think, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, no yeah. worries. I, I sure, you know, sure. I was, I was just sort of issuing Absolutely. a very gentle correction. Hopefully sure. it was, hopefully yes. it came across as a gentle, it did. A gentle, just like, okay, good. Yeah. Cause I, you know, I, I love, yeah. Anyway. Hmm. I'm glad that you're teaching Rebecca's books because Rebecca's books are amazing and mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> so I'm sorry to break in, but we are closing in on our ending time, but let, why don't we, uh, Chris, why don't you pick, take one more question? Uh, I'm sorry, we're not going to get to everybody's, but uh, so. Sure. Well, if we're going to go with, uh, we just got like a half a minute left here. Here's something that's really quick and easy to answer. They say, can you recommend um, some, well, let's see. They asked, what is your favorite book that you've read? recently hmm. science fiction and fantasy i assume they mean a favorite of yours oh hmm. uh that's not an easy question it's not all right i thought it would be a. I, I read up. uh i read a you could genre bending um uh, uh interior chinatown by charles Yu. i really enjoyed mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. um i'll throw out uh arkady martin's uh most recent uh, her most recent is um a desolation called peace uh but it's um a memory called empire which is her first novel that won the hugo award last year uh it is science fiction uh and it is an excellent i'll throw out i i really enjoyed earlier this year i read susanna clark's piranesi mm -hmm. and i thought that was fantastic a really unusual book i've only been yeah, reading like... published things so <laughs> <laughs> As, as I mentioned earlier, I just been reading uh, Unity by Ellie Bangs, which is a, just a fantastic kind of uh, 
future kind of somewhat post-apocalyptic thriller about, you know, kind of someone who can have like a, a shared consciousness among multiple people. And it's just, it's so fun. It's so great. I'm almost done reading it. I'm really loving it. It's so terrific. It's called Unity. Oh, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic discussion. I can see lots of uh, kudos and thank you in the chat. So I think the audience loved it. We had some great questions and I, I am really sorry we didn't get to all of them. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess we'll just leave you wanting more. So <laughs> um, as I said, this is the last uh, event of the festival. So thank you so much for uh, being here with us to all the panelists and, and helping us kind of wrap up a great weekend. And thank you to our audience. I mean, we certainly couldn't do it without you. So, uh, you know, until next year, thank mm -hmm. you and have a great night. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone.